We need to be experts in acute coronary syndromes and recognizing those situations. Those are some of the most impactful situations we can be involved in as EMS providers with those patients and keeping the mortality rate low. However, a very small portion of our cardiac calls are true acute coronary syndromes. There's actually several other cardiac emergencies that we need to be aware of that can be equally as deadly. So let's check these out and break down acute coronary syndromes and those five other deadly cardiac emergencies so that way you can spot them and make better clinical decisions for your patients. In the United States alone, there's going to be 8 million cardiac calls that are going to arrive at the hospital. And about a million of those calls are going to have a possibility of having some sort of acute coronary syndrome that's involved in their diagnosis. And a million of those people will actually have a myocardial infarction. It's a large amount of people that are going to be involved in our hospitals that are going to have some sort of acute coronary syndrome. And so it's important for us to recognize that because some of our calls or quite a few of our calls that are cardiac in origin are not going to be truly going to end up going to be acute coronary syndrome so we need to be very aware of the situation that we're presented with and making sure that we have a strong assessment and making sure we recognize when these acute coronary syndromes pop up we're ready for them and we can make a quick judgment call on them and get them to the right place because time is everything for these patients and us as EMS personnel can be directly involved in the impact on the mortality rate of these particular patients with our assessment and recognizing acute coronary syndromes. So let's get into that particular talk. So assessing this chest pain, we're gonna be doing a few things. First off, we obviously need to make sure that we're doing our rapid A, B, C check. Making sure that we are taking care of those and intervening when we need to, if we see a problem in our ABCs. That's an obvious one that we always do with every single patient. And now after that, we're going to make sure that we're gonna be checking lung sounds. Okay. Lung sounds are going to be important for identifying certain things like pulmonary edema and something along those lines is going to give us a quick indication that we have some sort of a pressure problem within the lungs that we need to correct immediately. And then finally we're going to check the pulse. Okay, and by checking the pulse, we're gonna be looking for a few things. We're gonna be looking for regularity of the pulse, the strength of the pulse, to see if maybe there is some sort of irregular rhythm going on with this particular pulse in order to identify that maybe we have an electrical problem that we need to be dealing with. But these are the first few things that you're going to be looking for in order to quickly assess chest pain is the ABCs, the lung sounds, and the pulse, and is obviously getting your OP Cure STA out of the way to identify the classic signs of cardiac or ACS involvement. So now, after we've gotten into our OP Cure STA, we've identified that this is a probable or a likely cardiac event or acute coronary syndrome event. Now we need to start getting actually going involved with our treatment. And we call this open gambit. Okay, the open gambit. And with the open gambit, we're gonna do some very standard things that we're gonna do with any cardiac or respiratory type of patient or pulmonary involvement type of patient. Those open gambit things are going to be O2, okay, SBO2, making sure that we get an IV, and of course getting an ECG. That includes a four lead and a 12 lead. Okay, all really important things to make sure that we are getting the first sets of our treatment up and ready to go for this particular patient. Now we know what we call the open gambit is a standard treatment. The reason we call it that is because we would again do this with any cardiac or pulmonary involvement patient. So we might as well get this started because it doesn't matter what our diagnosis or our impression is these things are going to happen regardless of what we believe the diagnosis is going to be. So we're gonna get these started as our standard treatments for this particular patient. And again, allowing us to get a little bit more diagnosis going on to confirm our suspicion whether this is ACS or not.
Now we know of the classic symptoms we typically see with acute coronary syndrome, but it also depends on if we're seeing angina or if we're seeing a true infarction because these symptoms and the longevity of those symptoms will be an important distinction of whether we're looking at angina or a true infarction. So for example, typically with both of those acute coronary syndromes, we see things like substernal chest pain that is described as a squeezing pressure and standing or pushing down on that type of pain. Uh, that is typically how it's described. It's not often described as sharp or tearing or pulling, which is more describing a different type of cardiac emergency, which we're going to talk about in part two. Now, going back to the distinction between angina and a true myocardial infarction. Now, angina is often brought on by some sort of exertion. That's an important thing to ask within your history to see if maybe there's something that brought on this pain or this acute coronary syndrome. Syndrome. Some exertion can bring on that angina and it's often relieved by rest or pharmacological intervention using nitroglycerin to relieve that pain and kind of get them back into their normal state. That is likely an angina state where it's a more of a temporary acute coronary syndrome that's relieved easily by rest or pharmacological intervention. Now, myocardial infarctions are not so easily to get, rid, to get rid of. And so when it comes to these types of uh, these types of emergencies where we're dealing with a true myocardial infarction, we're still dealing with that chest pain, okay? That chest pain. But that chest pain is very different in the sense that it's going to be more substernal. It's going to be center of the chest. It's going to be described as a pushing, squeezing, and weight on the chest type of pain, where it's a little bit different from that stabbing, tearing, and pulling type of pain that we typically see with something like an aortic dissection, one of the other cardiac emergencies that we're going to talk about in part two. So those are the kind of things that you're looking for is the description of that pain to give you the clue that maybe this is a myocardial infarction that we need to be aware of. There's other symptoms that we need to be looking for too. Things like diaphoresis, radiating pain to the left arm, uh, pallor, any type of paleness. We can look for a certain, you know, uh, pulmonary edemas. These are all really good indicators that we're dealing with or potentially dealing with a serious myocardial infarction that we need to intervene with immediately. Now there are a few other things we need to be aware of as well because there is atypical acute coronary syndrome symptoms that we need to be looking out for. Things like back pain, nausea, epigastric pain. Those are all symptoms that we are starting to see more commonly. In fact, one in 10 patients may not even describe their acute coronary syndrome of pain at all. They might just have nausea, not feeling well, diaphoresis, short of breath. Those are the things that they're describing and not describing any chest pain whatsoever. That's one in 10 patients that are describing that. That's actually a significant amount to be watching out for. So we need to be getting really good at our assessments and getting very, very distinct in our history taking and our question asking to make sure that we don't miss those atypical acute coronary syndrome signs that we could often miss if we're not asking the right questions. Now, after we have that suspicion, our patient is telling me that they're having chest pains uh, described as squeezing, they're diaphoretic, they're not feeling well, they're nauseous, they have left arm pain. Those are all really good indicators that we're dealing with a very classic looking acute coronary syndrome, possibly a myocardial infarction. Now, the best tool that we have in order to confirm our suspicions is a 12 lead ECG. And how important is it? Well, this 12 lead ECG, this adoption of the 12 lead ECG has increased or actually increased our, our a, or decreased our mortality rate by 25 to 37 percent. So a direct involvement with pre-hospital ECG has had a direct impact by 25 to 30 percent to 37 percent of mortality rates. That's a massive drop in mortality rates by including EMS in this important diagnostic thing. And the reason it's so important is because the earlier we recognize an acute coronary syndrome, the faster we're gonna take them to the appropriate facility, and we're gonna be able to bypass a lot of that triage because we've already confirmed this situation. And so with these patients, we're actually saving them 30 minutes or more by actually doing this 12 lead ECG and identifying a true myocardial infarction on there. So I just told you that the 12 lead ECG is one of the most single, most important 
diagnostic tools that we have on the ambulance and we're going to be using that to decrease the mortality rate by 25 to even up to 37 percent and save this patient 30 minutes or more going to the right hospital or making sure that we're bypassing those early stages of the hospital entry to get to the end of statement and getting to the pci now that being said what are we looking for on this 12 lead ecg what we're looking for is the patient having ST elevation in two contiguous leads, meaning that we're having ST elevation in two leads that are looking anatomically at the same area of the heart. Meaning that if we were looking at lead three and we had a little bit of elevation there and we had a lead four had a little bit of elevation there, that's not two contiguous leads because lead three is looking at the inferior portions of the heart and V4 is looking more at the anterior portions of the heart not two anatomical contiguous leads or locations, which means that it's not diagnostic. That being said, when we have two contiguous leads looking at the same anatomical spot, that's a good indication for ST or for a STEMI or a myocardial infarction. So looking here in this particular ECG, we have V3 and we have V4, both look like they have some sort of abnormalities, and even V5 has slightly elevated ST segments. So what are we looking for? Well, let's look at this QRS complex right here. What we're looking for in particular is this J point. Now this J point right here is that right there. And what we're looking for is the difference between that location and how much it's elevated compared to the isoelectric line, which is this line right here. And if we have more than one millimeter of elevation from that isoelectric line, and we have that in two contiguous or two anatomically uh, close locations like V3 and V4, which are both looking at the anterior portions of the heart, that gives us an indication that we have a positive finding of a STEMI, which is an ST elevated myocardial infarction. So this can tell us that we need to go to an appropriate facility to get the PCI this patient actually needs. So that's what we're looking for in order to really make the impact with this particular patient when we have the suspicion of cardiac involvement, some sort of acute coronary syndrome involvement, and then doing the 12 lead to confirm our suspicions can truly save this patient's life. And we've seen that in the statistics and saving this patient time is everything Thanks so much for checking out this video. Hopefully it got you a pretty good idea of what we're looking for when it comes to typical and atypical chest pains that could be acute coronary syndromes and using your 12 lead ECG to truly identify that ST elevation and making sure that we are taking this patient to the appropriate facility and taking care of them. The second part is gonna be talking about the other cardiac or chest pains that we can see, cardiac emergencies that can be equally as deadly as a myocardial infarction that we often miss in EMS. And so we're going to be talking about those ones so that way you can spot them and make better clinical decisions for your patients. We'll see you next time.